Thank you all for being here today and coming to hear the talk. And also thanks very much to the Imagine Belfast um, Festival organizers for giving me the chance to share my work with you all here today. Now, as Jeff said, I'm gonna be talking about some of the findings of my new book, which I worked on for more than seven years. It's the first book to document the movement to reform the sodomy law in the early 19th century in Britain, right? In Britain's age of reform. Now, this was a period that saw the first Whig liberal government in two generations. It saw the Great Reform Act of 1832, the abolition of slavery in 1833, municipal um, government reform, poor law reform, and the abolition of the death penalty for 200 separate crimes, more than 200 separate crimes over the course of a 10 year period. Now, what I found to sort of add to this narrative of the age of reform was an amazing debate about the ethics of executing men for sodomy. It had its beginnings in the late 18th century and culminated with parliamentary debates in 1840 and 1841 with Lord John Russell pictured here, making a speech where he argued against the death penalty for sodomy. Many individuals I found both publicly and privately advocated for this reform in the 1810s, 1820s, 1830s. It was a remarkable and untold story, previously untold story of politics, of advocacy, of love and of compassion. It was also a difficult book to get published in many ways, in large part because so many people thought that it wasn't possible for there to be a politics around the sodomy law in the early 19th century. These were some of the main objections I heard as I was researching this project, right? That the idea that sodomy was the worst of crimes was not seriously contested in this period, that it had nothing to do with the political debates of the period that no man would speak publicly about sodomy for fear of losing their reputation, and that there was almost no evidence left, even if anything had happened. And then also, too, from more theoretical historians, um, I was sort of accused of trying to find a modern homosexual identity in a period before it was said to exist, right, from the late 19th century forward. So in the course of my talk here today, I'm going to show you how I addressed these objections as well as tell you the story of these remarkable events before ending with a few thoughts on what this might mean for future research and our understanding of the past. So let's start with the first objection, that no one publicly contested the idea that this was the worst of crimes. Well, that's just wrong. Um, some people certainly used that rhetoric and they were very loud and they were the ones who remembered most, but they were also many people who were more tolerant. Uh, one incredibly influential individual who was, was pictured here, the philosopher and legal theorist, Jeremy Bentham. Uh, Bentham was perhaps the most influential legal theorist of the first half of the 19th century. Now, and as early as the 1970s, Bentham's writings against the sodomy law were rediscovered. Over 70 manuscript pages, but it was also assumed that he kept these ideas secret for fear of losing his reputation because he wrote right in that, those manuscript pages about fear of what would happen to his philosophy if these ideas became associated with it. So it was assumed he never published, but he never published those 70 manuscript pages. But in fact, he did publish five paragraphs based on them in his most popular work of legal reform. The Principles of Morals and Legislation, right? Published in um, 18, um, excuse me, in 1789. Again, only five paragraphs of this 300 page work are about the sodomy law, but this book is about how to reform the law code in general, every aspect of the law. So it stands to reason that only a small part about it would be centered on the sodomy law. So this means that Bentham's arguments that there was no rational justification for the state punishment of sex between men in any form were known to those who were involved in the process of legal reform because absolutely everybody read Bentham. Napoleon called Bentham's, this work by Bentham a work of genius, and it informed the writing of the Napoleonic Code. It also informed 
the writing of the law codes of South America, of liberal states in Central Europe, many German states that rewrote their law codes in this period, and many dropped the sodomy law as a result. And when we learn to look for it, we can find many references to same-sex desire in the late 19th century within British culture. This image, for instance, is titled Refined Taste, and it's meant to mock men of sensibility, right, um, as it was called at the time, who had an overly emotional reaction to an aesthetic experience. In this case, the idea of going out into a landscape and being sort of overwhelmed by the majesty and the beauty of the landscape. This image was published in 1772 when the man pictured in the inset of the image in the upper right-hand corner was involved in a sensational case that involved a royal pardon. He had been convicted of sodomy and he had received a royal pardon. And this sparked a debate about what exactly the punishment for sodomy should be. Now, notice the hilt of the gentleman's sword, though, how it's suggestively placed and how he seems to be looking more at the soldier than the landscape. And also notice the um, the sword, the shaft of the soldier's sword, and where it's falling on his figure. These are not accidents, right? This is meant to sort of mock um, men who are overly emotional, indicating perhaps that they also feel, right, same-sex desire, that that's what they're really appreciating, the soldier, not the landscape. Now, this is critiquing men who sexually desire other men, but it's certainly not calling for their execution. Also, to take this, take this image, uh, marriage a la mode. Um, this is from the Marriage a la mode series from William Hogarth, uh, the most important British painter of the mid 18th century. Now, this is critiquing uh, an ill matched couple, an upper class person and a middle class person. Uh, there are references to excess throughout this image. We don't have time to unpack them all, but it is critiquing excesses of heterosexual desire as well as same sex desire. This woman and man on the right-hand side, she is entertaining a man who is not her husband in her bedchamber, but notice how those two figures are linked by that canvas over her mirror and how they touch on the picture of Jupiter and Io. That is an image um, from an allusion to the classical myth of heterosexual seduction. So Hogarth is making a moral critique of their behavior through this. But now look on the other side, on the left-hand side of the, of the image. And notice those three male individuals, including that wonderfully effeminate man with his legs crossed, who's daintily sipping a cup of tea. And then the man with the beak-like nose leering over his shoulder. Well, the image behind them is Zeus and Ganymede, right? With the uh, Zeus in the form of an eagle whisking a young man off to Mount Olympus, right? To be his cupbearer, as well as the sexual relationship that develops between them. The beak-like nose is meant to sort of reference Zeus Right, this is a Zeus and Ganymede image. Same sex desire is being implicated in those individuals. Right, once we learn how to read the culture, we see this discussion about gender and sexuality and same sex desire that's running throughout. It's often disapproving, but it's not about calling for executions. But executions were a real issue in this period, and really never more so in British history, because there was a wave of executions for sodomy that happened in the first decades of the 19th century. The largest ever, more executions in a 20-year period than happened in the whole of the 18th century. Now, why did this happen? It was largely because the criminal justice system was coming under extreme pressure due to the Napoleonic Wars. This was a time before modern prisons or modern policing, so that the death penalty was still the main punishment for a wide range of felonies. And that's why executions are spiking for this. Bentham was appalled that so many men were being executed for a private consensual act. And he wrote a much more extensive argument in the 1810s meant to undermine the legal basis for such executions. Bentham's new work was titled, Not Paul, But Jesus. And that was a reference to the idea that the denial of pleasure principle, the aesthetic principle, was something that St. Paul had talked about, right? But it was never within the work of Jesus. And so much of the condemnation of sexuality in Christianity, he argued, came from St. Paul, right? It wasn't actually in Jesus, therefore it wasn't really central to Christianity. This isn't an anti-religious argument, right? This is a different interpretation of religion. So 
Um, this was also based on his utilitarian principles and whole chapters of this new work um, were to argue against the punishment of sex between men. Now, he wrote this in two parts. The first part was published anonymously. Part two that dealt more with sex between men was not. Many scholars, said, well, uh, a number of scholars, Bentham specialists knew about part two, but again, they felt that Bentham had never published it, had never shared it for fear of damaging his reputation. But I was looking for political connections and I found out that he did share it. He shared it with this individual, William Beckford. Beckford was then a member of parliament and Bentham outlined the arguments of part two of not Paul, but Jesus to Beckford, asking him to be the patron and the sponsor of the work. William Beckford was a novelist, a collector, a member of parliament, for a time, the wealthiest man in Britain, right Font Hill Abbey pictured here was the private house he built from it for himself with a significant part of that fortune. But he had been socially ostracized for decades. He bought a rotten borough seat so he didn't have to face an electorate. He and William Courtney, eight years his junior and the son of a Viscount had been discovered together in 1784 in a sexually compromising position. Now, Beckford wasn't prosecuted. He was too wealthy and too elite for prosecution for this, but he was socially ostracized and shut out from polite upper, upper class society. The invitation was for Beckford to help Bentham lessen the stigma that had so marred his life. Bentham also asked Beckford to use his classical knowledge to write a companion to not Paul, but Jesus that would use examples from the ancient world to argue against the punishment of sexual tastes that harmed no one, to complement Bentham's philosophical and utilitarian arguments. Now, no explicit response from Beckford survives, but evidence in Beckford's papers held at Oxford University indicates that he took up the offer. The result was part of an obscure 50-page privately circulated poem known to Byron scholars as Don Leon. Now, Don Leon contains beautiful arguments about the inborn nature of same-sex desire in some individuals. And it also contains angry and forceful calls to political activism. Let's take a look at some of these passages for just a second. Thus passed my boyhood, and though proofs were none, what path my future course of life would run? Like sympathetic ink, if then unclear, the test applied soon made the trace appear. Now, sympathetic ink is a term that means invisible ink. So what's being said here is that same-sex desire can be written in character since birth, but latent, invisible, even to the individual, but only becoming known over time and through experience, right? What a beautiful metaphor for sexual awakening. Or this other line, sheer indignation quickens into rhyme, silence now were tantamount to crime. Right, silence now were tantamount to crime. What an amazing precursor to that phrase from ACT UP and Larry Kramer and the fight against AIDS, right? Silence equals death. We can see that early on. These phrases were written in 1817, 1817. But Don Leon is not just about same sex desire, just as Bentham wasn't just about same sex desire in his work on sexuality. It was to end the sodomy law in, as a whole. And it made an argument that the sodomy law hurt opposite sex couples as well as same sex couples. The right to marital privacy is violated by the state, by the sodomy law. And including this was part of the political argument to give every man a stake um, in ending the sodomy law to end the right of the state to intrude it in his bedroom, right? So Don Leon has a, wonderful narrative about a companionate same-sex couple that share emotional right um, as well as physical connections um, and about opposite sex couples right in marriage. Both of these are part of the argument. This wasn't written by Byron, but it was written in the voice of Byron since he was associated at least for some with allegations that he had committed sodomy both with men and his wife. Don Leon is not anti-religious. Um, as some have claimed. But again, it's an argument that it is more in keeping with religious principles to end the sodomy law than to keep them. 
These were the private ways in which sodomy could be discussed in the early 19th century to bring about political change. This is the political idiom of the time that we have to attune ourselves to. All right. What about the other objection, the next objection, the idea that this had nothing to do with popular politics? Well, actually, sodomy allegations were a part of some of the more heated political arguments of the day. Not all, of course, but some. And tolerance extended to some individuals might seem like unequal justice to others and be used in the fractious um, politics between the social classes in the period. Politics was extremely polarized in the 1810s and 1820s. Some say Britain was never closer to revolution than it was in this period. With radicals like William Cobbett, pictured here riding on the back of a demon, bringing the bones of Tom Paine back from America to England to serve as a radical rallying point, right? Um, Cobbett hammered at the corrupt old order that shut almost all out of politics, was just a self-serving elite. Um, now, Cobbett's attempt to use the, top, the bones of Tom Paine as a political rallying symbol, that fell quite flat. Um, he made use of other scandals, right? The Bishop of Clower scandal um, was a very prominent one. The Bishop of Clower was a bishop in the Church of Ireland uh, who was caught having sex with a soldier in a London public house. The bishop was allowed to post bail and escape while the soldier was forced to stand trial. So this is an example of unequal justice, right? The upper class person being treated in one way, the lower class person being treated in another. But we've missed what made the story so explosive in the early 19th century. This was not part of the story um, as it's been conventionally told. And that was the fact that another individual named James Byrne, a working class man, a lower class man, had accused the bishop of a sexual advance about 10 years before in Ireland. And the elites in Ireland rallied around the bishop. They ruined this poor man. They um, had him flogged through the streets, and I actually have some cartoons that depict this. He was imprisoned. He was financially ruined. Um, Cobbett brought him to London. He held banquets in his honor, and he is used as an example of what this elite will do to an honest working class man just to protect one of their own, right? Every time William Cobbett says the name James Byrne publicly, and he does this for years after this, he's evoking this visceral story of corruption and injustice that he's using to try and say that the system is so corrupt it needs to be overthrown. This is at the heart of politics in this period. And, um, and this is successful. So what Cobbett tried to do with the bones of Tom Paine, he successfully did with the story of James Byrne. So, all right. Now, following the James Byrne story got me to look again at the Castlereagh suicide, uh, which happened just a few weeks after the start of the Bishop of Clower affair. Castlereagh was then a cabinet minister, and he confessed that he had been blackmailed for years for the same crime as the Bishop of Clower. He told this to his friend, Harriet Arbuthnot, and she recorded it extensively in her diaries. He confessed it to George IV, and shortly thereafter, he took his own life. Now, one book investigated this. It was written in 1959 by H. Montgomery Hyde, and he proposed an interpretation for Castlereagh's statements that absolved him of sexual interest between men. And that story that Hyde put together has been quoted ever since. But Hyde was employed by the Castlereagh family, by the descendants of Castlereagh, um, when he wrote the book. Now, he doesn't lie or misrepresent. And Hyde actually does remarkable things to help to put forward the Wolfenden Commission, right, and to lessen the penalties for sex between men in his lifetime, in the 20th century. But he does mislead in the book, at least for people who want to be misled. He also provides information to allow people to see the full extent of the story for those who, who wish to investigate it by using his footnotes, right? So it's a very interesting, complicated book that is dealing with the politics of the 19th century and the 20th century when it was written. Um, and I detail you know, more about Hyde and his book in my own work. So 
So um, knowing how explosive and charged these events, these events were helped me to unpack Robert Peel's response to the Castlereagh suicide. This had not been done before. Uh, and what I was able to analyze was how Peel altered the laws to better protect men like Castlereagh from blackmail for infamous crimes, right? The thing that Castlereagh said um, he was being uh, um, blackmailed for. Uh, but Peel also increased the prosecutions for sex between men um, at the same time, so as not to seem as if he was protecting elite sodomites. Dozens and dozens of reported arrests in court cases um, were um, published, publicized in the summer of 1825. It took a few years for the legislation to work through and for it to be effective, but the summer of 1825 is when these prosecutions really become prominent. This individual, Richard Heber, was forced to resign from Parliament in the summer of 1825 because of this. Among other things, Heber had been accused of propositioning a younger man of his own class. And the first letter in a series that arranged for his resignation between him and Peel had burn after reading written across the top. Now, fortunately, that didn't happen, and I was able to use these records to reconstruct the story. Henry Gray Bennett was also a member of parliament and he was run out of his position in the summer of 1825 as well in a similar way and for similar reasons. Now, William Banks was not run out of parliament, but he was in parliament in the summer of 1825 and he was indignant at what had happened and he was furious at Peel for what he had done. And he wrote about the session and added that writing to the poem, Don Leon. Now, his papers don't confirm this outright, uh, but he, at least not that I've been able to find yet, but textual analysis discussed in Beyond the Law can all but confirm that Banks wrote some of these later updates. Passages like this one name many specific individuals in Parliament and can be used to identify the exact parliamentary session in which um, these events happened that are being described. The poem had previously been dated to 1833, and because of that, people have missed the political significance because it didn't line up with the political events of 1833. But by properly dating the poem, we can see just how much specific political information it actually contains. So what about the idea that no man would publicly speak on this for fear of losing their reputation? One key point about all of these men that I've discussed so far, Banks and Beckford and Bentham, is that they argued against the sodomy laws in ways that were discreet or that didn't call attention to themselves. The stigma was absolutely real and it was something people had to deal with. But to have reform legislation, there had to be a public sponsor. Who would do this? Who would be brave enough, right, as one magistrate told to Lord John Russell? So he said, I firmly believe that the only reason why we still have the death penalty for this is because it's so difficult to find anyone hardy enough to undertake what might be considered the defense of the crime. Right? So who would be hardy enough? Who would be brave enough to do this? Well, a real opportunity comes about in 1830. The Whigs are in power, as I mentioned at the start of the talk, for the first time in two generations. And we see this wave of reforms on voting rights, on the abolition of slavery, on ending the death penalty in so many other areas. Now, I know conclusively that Lord John Russell wants to end the death penalty for sodomy. This can be confirmed with his writings. But he wants to eliminate it for almost every other area first because he doesn't want to put other reforms in danger by championing this too early. He also doesn't want this to be a government bill right, because he doesn't want the government to face potential stigma over it. At first, he recruits a backbench MP who just came to Parliament uh, to be the sponsor of this legislation. He, but he bundles it with a few other reforms, but Charles Law, the individual, doesn't fight for this legislation in 1835, even though he proposes it. It passes the Commons, but then it dies in the House of Lords, and very few records survive of this because of that. 
the two men who proposed the later legislation that is fought for and debated and which leaves a lasting impression in the record are Fitzroy Kelly and Stephen Lushington. They know they have government support, but they are doing this on their own individual initiative. So what do we know about these individuals, right? What can we say about them? Well, Fitzroy Kelly is the one who does most of the heavy lifting on this. And he is brand new to parliament, just like Charles Law was, but he's also about as far from the world of established patriarchal masculinity as you could find in the parliament in this period. He was the son of the novelist, Isabella Kelly, who supported herself and her three children on the proceeds from her writing. She basically saved her family from financial ruin um, through her work as a novelist after the early death of her profligate husband. Uh, Fitzroy Kelly was educated in a day school. He never went to public school. He never went to university. But eventually, through hard work and talent, he would rise to become attorney general of Great Britain by the end of his career. His brother was William Kelly an unsuccessful actor who was involved for 10 years in, a no, in, an, in an emotional, financial, and most likely very romantic relationship with this individual, Matthew Gregory Lewis. Kelly has been described as, quote, the absorbing passion of Lewis's life, unquote. Um, and this was in a book that documented Lewis's attractions to men. Um, this was written in the 1930s. And in fact, um, the same-sex desires of Matthew Gregory Lewis have been talked about in scholarship uh, really throughout the 20th and 21st centuries. What about Stephen Lushington, the other half of the, this co-sponsor team? He had a long career in parliament. He was uh, very prominent um, as a Whig and a radical. He voted to abolish the slave trade in 1807. He is one of only eight men whose name is carved on the Buxton Memorial to the abolition of slavery on the grounds of the Palace of Westminster. So prominent was he in the abolition movement. He was also trained in the law and he eventually became a judge. He was known for supporting women in divorce and separation cases. He aggressively supported women because he said the law was always so stacked on the side of the men, women needed an aggressive advocate. Lushington was also Lady Byron's legal advisor. He was the person most cited for using the threat to reveal that Byron had committed sodomy on Annabella to get Byron to give up custody rights for their infant daughter, Ada. He was blasted in print a decade later for interfering in what a married man and woman might choose to do in their own private bedchamber. So Lushington is already publicly associated with sodomy. But there's another further family connection. Stephen Lushington's brother was married to Matthew Gregory Lewis's sister. Given the link between Matthew and William, a web of family and kinship connects the protagonists. Family, I argue, is a motivation for taking a risk, for correcting an injustice, for motivating individuals to act in a way that Bentham's utilitarian philosophy alone was not enough. So what now about the idea that there's almost no evidence that survives about this? Well, when you know the connections uh, that they were trying to hide, it actually becomes a lot easier to find information and information starts to seem quite abundant. This, for instance, is a passage that Lord John Russell, um, a, a verbatim transcript of something from Hansard, the official parliamentary record of the debates of parliament. Now, this is where Lord John Russell is talking about his feelings on the elements of the bill that Kelly and Lushington put forward. He never says the word sodomy, but he's speaking about the clauses of the bill in the order that they appeared in the bill. Um, so if we look to where he says, it was because the offense was beyond the law, right where the book title comes from, and above the law. It was an offense that could only find its punishment in the feelings of mankind. Its punishment must be in the conscience of the offender, right? Um, its punishment was in the retribution of eternity, but they as men could not attempt to assign it its adequate punishment, right? So it's not a ringing endorsement of the behavior. Certainly, we wouldn't expect that from a cabinet minister, right, and a leader in the House of Commons in um, 1840. But it is 
how you can have the government arguing to end the death penalty for sodomy in this period. And it passes. It passes every single vote right in the House of Commons. And we need to understand this. We need to have this become part of how we understand the early 19th century, that this was possible. All right. Another thing we need to understand is that this bill was killed in the House of Lords, but only in its final vote in the House of Lords. And it was one of the most reactionary members of that body by almost every account from the time that killed it. He killed it by saying that if Parliament passed this bill, it would be saying that it condoned sodomy. And he repeated that word, sodomy, over and over. Uh, and almost all of the supporters of the bill never said that word, right? And this made the more tepid supporters of the bill flee from it, right? And this is how it ended up being killed in the House of Lords. This was also the MP, um, the, the Lord, the member of the House of Lords, by the way, who had challenged the Duke of Wellington to a duel over Catholic emancipation. So strongly did he feel that Catholics should not have the vote. Um, he resisted almost every Whig reform in the age of reform. Now, the Duke of Wellington, by contrast, was friends with William Banks, and he gave a character witness to Banks uh, at his trial when Banks had been arrested for having sex with a, um, with a soldier. The, Welling the Duke of Wellington also gave a character witness for another friend who faced similar accusations a few years later. So was this the worst of crimes? Well, most quietly supported the reform, most MPs, we know that because of their votes. Um, and many of them supported it on the record as well as off, because some of these votes have division lists, so the names of the supporters are recorded for all time. Individuals refuse to see friends and family as sodomites. So what does this say about the constituencies of these MPs, though, right? What does it say um, about the broader culture? What implications can we draw from this? So... You might ask now, let's return to that final question. Am I trying to push modern homosexual identity back into a period before the late 19th century? No, what I'm trying to do is understand individuals in the context of their time. Individuals like Anne Lister and the Chevalier Dion, they used Rousseau's ideas, right? The mid 18th century ideas about the unique or the expressive self and the imperative for individuals to follow that inner voice and to be true to an authentic idea of the self. They used, to used this to understand how they were different from others, and they used it to help them to live authentic lives. For Lister, over who she loved, right? And for the Chevalier Dion, over how they expressed their gender identity, right? Rousseau is important, but he's not the only text that could be used this way. He's only one of many. In fact, most of the major philosophers of the modern period who propose a theory of the state and politics based on liberal principles, they also have a work where they talk about the individual and the education of the individual for that particular society. Individuals always have to be understood in the context of their time, right? So these first works um, by Locke and Rousseau and Wollstonecraft and Freud even too um, are about how you understand the self, right, and the individual. The second work is um, their works on sort of how society should be structured based on these principles. You could even do this with Hobbes, although Hobbes's theory of the individual and his theory of the state are both right within Leviathan. With these ideas in mind um, and this evidence in mind, it also seems like the emphasis on the late 19th century as the critical moment for change and understanding the self in relation to sexuality, that may have been due to just a lack of information and research on gender and sexuality for the 18th and early 19th century when these books, right, that set the whole framework for the history of sexuality were written. These books were written more than 40 years ago. We didn't know about the diaries of Anne Lister, right, um, back then. The Chevalier Dion, if anybody knew about it, you know, was they, they weren't discussed significantly, right? We've added new information. And in fact, if you reread these books, they're actually compatible with this idea of thinking more about the 18th century and early 19th century as in a continuum with what happens in, the, um, in later periods. So I think what I found for the early 19th century strengthens the argument for looking more closely at the 18th century material 
Um, other important events like the one that I found may yet to be discovered or other events that we know just a little bit or sort of superficially may prove to be a lot more significant than we think. There are scholars who have been talking about this for a very long time, the importance of the 18th century, Randy Trombach, R Richter Norton. There are newer scholars that are doing amazing work on 18th century using these types of ideas. Uh, Jen Mannion's Female Husbands, right? Dominic James, Picturing the Closet, right? All very important works. These individuals, right, may not have been modern homosexuals, but we shouldn't just say what they were not, right? We need to understand what they were, how they thought about themselves, and how society thought about them. The 18th and early 19th centuries could be wonderfully queer, and we need to incorporate this into our understandings of the period as a whole, because this is the only way to have a truly accurate history of not just queer people, but the best possible history of all of us. And that's my talk. Thank you very much. I have a question for you, Chuck, if that's uh, all right if I kick off. You, you, you spoke about Bentham informing the ideas of the French Revolution. I was asking if there's evidence to suggest that influence went the other way with the rational secularization of the French Revolution, what effect it might have had on the debate in general within British politics during that period, that early 19th century? Um, you know, it's a um, great question. And I think that the biggest impact for Britain, interestingly enough, of the um, in Britain of the French Revolution is that it's making it more reactionary, right? Because the British elites don't change. The elite manages to hold on, right? That the king's not executed, the aristocracy isn't um, overthrown, right? But they're, they're highly threatened. So that makes them far more reactionary. And it's that kind of polarization that makes the 1820s and, um, and, and 1810s so politically potentially dangerous. If anything, reform is delayed because of that, and it's only um, and it's only after you move away from that period more, right? It's it's no accident, I think, that the age of reform only really starts in 1830, once um, that powder keg has sort of been diffused to someone. So, so there are people who are inspired by the ideas of the French Revolution, sort of outside of the government. But my story is kind of a lot about people trying to change the system from within. And so often what they want to do is harken back to this more sort of British tradition of, of Bentham, right? Um, a British solution to the British law problem, as opposed to looking to the example of France, which wouldn't get you nearly as many votes, right, in the parliament at this time. No. Thank you, Joe. Um, <coughs> we don't appear to have any other questions, um, Chuck. Um, and perhaps we'll just give it a few more moments why people might formulate them and just follow up on that. From that question, you seem to be suggesting that the reactionary nature of the British, the British establishment stifled the reforms you're talking about. Could, could you see any traces of that reactionary um, attitude within the 1820s and 1830s beyond the right-wing Tory that you identified, uh, West, Duke, the Earl of uh, West, Wesley, whatever he was, sorry, I, I didn't get his name. Oh, yeah, uh, 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 Wynne Chelsea. Uh, Wynne Chelsea, yes. Um, yeah, it's, um, it's interesting. You know, other scholars have focused a lot more on the kind of um, the arguments, you know, the worst of crimes type of arguments. So in my book, I tried to really emphasize those that were formulating it in, in sort of different ways. And um, yeah, there, this, there, there is a strong group of conservatives, people who are resisting this. Um, in fact, I'm able, because I've got the division lists to really get into who voted for this reform and who didn't at various different points. And even though it passed the commons, Right, there are seven different votes that I have division lists that happen in, in um, 35, 40, and 41. Um, so for instance, uh, William Gladstone is um, always votes against this reform, right? Peel always votes against this reform. Um, whereas, uh, let's see, um, there are the, the nephew of Castlereagh um, votes for it at one point, right? There are other people. Disraeli doesn't show up 
for the votes. He's absent um, for some reason and for a lot of these. Um, let's see, uh, Daniel O'Connell votes for the reform, right? Um, so you can actually kind of see the party divisions. Out er in an early stage of this project, I wanted to try and see if I could like do a collective biography of the people who voted for the reform versus yeah. the people who voted against it and to see if I could find anything. And I checked a lot of factors. I thought, well, what about educational background? I really didn't find any difference. What about age? Almost exact, eight, there was almost no difference in the cluster that voted for and against based on age. And almost every category I could think of, um, it, it, there wasn't really enough information to be conclusive, except for one category. There was one thing that I looked at where there was a lopsided um, cluster of um, uh, difference between those who voted for the reform and those who voted against it. Usually more liberals, I mean, on every vote, more liberals than Tories voted for it, but there were always li uh, Whigs and Tories on both sides, right? And liberals and conservatives on both sides. But the thing that was really lopsided was people who held future office. One of the things that the Parliamentary Papers database lets you check is um, every, every sort of like cabinet level office, every important position of distinction that someone would hold for the rest of their careers. And the people who voted to end the death penalty for sodomy um, had like three times as many like future offices as the ones who voted against it, right? So the ones who were more capable, who were more connected, right? Um, you know, and, and I couldn't help but thinking of the argument that Linda Colley made about Catholic emancipation, right? Because Colley basically argued that it was um, Catholic emancipation was most supported by the places that were most in the national mainstream, right? The most progressive, right? Um, and that it didn't really break down as much by party. And I kind of felt like I, I found the same thing, that those people, either Tory or Whig, who were attuned to what it takes to make a government work and, and these sort of broader kind of just sort of more cosmopolitan cultures, they were the ones who were vastly overrepresented in the supporters of ending the death penalty for sodomy. And I thought that was a really significant finding that speaks to your question. Pioneering research takes some digesting um, because it shakes what ideas we had or for, tried to formulate about that period. And uh, your book is certainly uh, shining a torch where others have not been before where it is still so under research and your book has made such a huge contribution to that and thank you very much for your talk um and your scholarship which uh, I'm, I'm no problem describing as remarkable and it was a pleasure to hear the lecture and thank you to all the people that logged in um so thank you very much and uh, have a nice evening bye-bye thank you very much